Um, so welcome everyone to a, another Dolphin Communication Project deep dive webinar. And today we are joined by Emma Longden and she is currently a, a master's student at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, where she's joining us from today. Uh, she's currently collaborating with the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program, and she's looking at how boat noise changed during various COVID-19 lockdowns and whether or not this influenced um, dolphin whistle rates. Um, she has in the past worked with the Namibian Dolphin Project using bottlenose dolphin whistles to count the number of animals in the population. And that's what today's talk is going to focus on. Um, your DCP team is here to monitor the chat. You can submit your questions to everyone, um, to Dolphin Communication Project. Uh, we are going to save questions for the end today. Um, and as you will find your microphone muted, please go ahead and make sure that you use that chat function to submit your questions. And then a final reminder that we are recording. So if you don't want to be visible, um, make sure that your video is off. And with that, I am going to turn the screen over to Emma. Cool, I think I've unmuted myself. Um, yeah, you're muted again. Oh, there you are. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll just- And um, Emma, just to, to help with bandwidth and whatnot, I'm gonna make my video disappear, uh, but just give me, I'm here. So just give me a shout um, if you need anything. Yeah, that's fine. If, if you can't hear me at any point, then please let me know. Love um. It. So cool, I will begin. So yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to give this talk. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a piece of work that I did that was published last year and it's about um, counting dolphins using their whistles. Um, so just a bit of background about me. So I did this project, it was sort of inspired from when I went out to volunteer with the Namibian Dolphin Project in Walvis Bay, Namibia, which is a lot of where these photos uh, come from. So that was during my undergraduate degree at the University of Plymouth. and. Um, yeah, I then worked with them for that for my project, and then we published this paper last year. Uh, I'm now a student at the University of St Andrews, studying for a master's degree in marine mammal science. And with that, um, I am working with the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program. So still looking at bottlenose dolphin and Q6, but um, moved over to a, a different continent. So for anybody that doesn't know uh, where Namibia is, it's here in on the map. So it's in the southern region of Africa. It sits just above. Uh, South Africa and it has a coast along that west coastline of Africa. So to begin with this talk I'm going to give you a bit of a, a background about counting animals, why we do it and how we do it. So to begin with the simple question of why count animals. So a pretty simple answer to that question is just to simply know how many are there. So lots of um, the questions that we ask in science are just driven by our curiosity. So we might just be interested in those animals and want to know how many are there and about their lives and where they range and simple questions like that. We might need to know if the population is increasing or, de or decreasing. So this is obviously pretty important for things like conservation and management of animals. And with that, there may also be laws that mean that animal populations must be counted regularly to know whether it is increasing or decreasing. Animals may have an impact on our lives. So for example, animals that we eat, such as fish, uh, we catch a lot of fish each year, but we need to know of the amount we're taking, how many are there still left? So that's quite an important reason. Or for example, if animals pose danger to us, if you're in an area that has a dangerous animal, such as a bear, you might need to know how many of those animals are in that area, what the threat is to, to a human population there. And another reason may be because they may cause harm. So species such as the lionfish, that's the picture in the bottom, is an invasive species. So it wasn't meant to be there and it got taken to the area usually by humans. So we might wanna know how many of those invasive species or how big is their population in the area to know how to tackle them and how much of a threat they are. So now we've decided that we want to count animals. You need to know how you want to count animals. So you need to consider basic things such as your species, the ecosystem they're in, the terrain, can you access it, the weather in that area, can you realistically survey it, how expensive it is and how time consuming it is. 
So a nice way to know how many animals there are of different species across the globe would be simply to count them all. And this is known as a census. So in the UK, just I think last month, we had a nationwide census. So essentially, a uh, form was sent to every house in the country. We had to fill in basic information like how many people live there, how old we are, what jobs they do. And this can help things like the government decide where they need to create more jobs or more houses. So this is similarly, if we apply this to animals, you may need to you may then find out where they need protection or where there's more or fewer of them. So this would be pretty nice, but it's kind of unideal because so many species move, they migrate, they hibernate, or maybe just lots of the animals look the same. So if you wanted to count every animal in a bee colony, that might be pretty difficult. The nearest you probably get to a census in counting animals is things like aerial surveys. So in the second picture is a picture taken from the sky and it's looking down on seals on the beach. So they time this at the time of the year where most seals are most likely to be on the beach and seen in these photographs and they take a picture of them all. And that's sort of the nearest you can get to censusing and counting all of the animals in a population. So failing that, you could do an incomplete count. So this is counting an area, um, counting the animals within an area and scaling this up. So if you wanted to know how many uh, crabs were on a rocky shore, you might count them in a small area and then multiply that up depending on how big the whole area is. So you've only taken a small sample. Another way is an indirect count. So you might count something that shows that the animal is there. So on the bottom is a muskrat house. And depending on how many of those houses there are, tells you something about how many muskrats are there. And the final way is the way that I'm gonna focus on today. And that is a method called capture mark recapture. So the capture mark recapture is based on this kind of simple, kind of confusing equation. So I'll walk you through it and give you an example. So hopefully we can understand how it then applies to the dolphins. So to understand how many animals are in a population, you need to go and capture the animals. And this makes your first sample. You then multiply this number by the number you then capture in your second sample. And you divide this by the number that have a mark in the second sample. So if we take a really uh, straightforward example with these birds, we've got six birds here. This makes our first sample and we mark them with a tag around their leg so that we know when they go and come back, if they have that tag, we've already seen it before. So we maybe give it a few weeks, let them disperse, let them come back and make another uh, recapture of the same species. So we can see here we've got eight in our second sample and we have to divide this by the number with the marks which here we can see is four animals. So that gives us an estimate of 12, which sounds about right, because the most we ever caught was eight, and there's quite a likelihood that there's a few that we haven't seen in either of the samples. So our best estimate is 12 animals here. But this relies on a number of assumptions. So to be able to do mark recapture on a population, the first uh, assumption is that the mark... So um, the mark must be permanent. It must not harm the animal and it mustn't make them more likely to be captured. So, for example, here, if the collar fell off the animal, it's not it's going to sort of mess up those ratios in the equation. If it harms the animal, if the animal then dies from it again, that's um, not very good for the animal, but it also doesn't really fit well with our equation. And also it can't make them more likely to be captured. So if that collar had a big bell on that notified us every time the animal was coming near and we could see it, then that would make it really obvious. So that isn't good either. The second one is that there must be no emigration or immigration between capture occasions. So you're focusing on your one population and if you wait years and years before you come back to, to count that popula population again, animals from a neighbouring colony may have joined or animals from your population may have left. So again, that violates our mark recapture assumptions. So you, you may be need to do those captures um, fairly close together. There also must be no births or deaths between those capture occasions. So if lots of animals are born suddenly in your when you go out for your second recapture event, there's lots more animals there to be captured. All animals must be equally likely to be captured. So if you had maybe males that were really confident, they came around humans quite frequently, they were really easy to see, but females were really shy, didn't come anywhere near them, that again would violate that assumption. 
And then the last one is that the samples must be independent. So you need that time in between them for those animals to reintegrate to the population, to mix about and then to be recaught. So for any of this to work, we need to be able to tag the animals. So here's just some basic tags that are still used today on different animals. So you've got an ear tag on a mouse, a number marked on a snail, a jackdaw with an aluminium ring around its leg, a tag being put on a whale shark, and a collar around a, a rock hyrax. And these will all have an individually unique number that tells you. So when you capture the animal, you can see its number and you can know when it was captured, how many times. And again, this information feeds into the, that equation and you can work out how many animals you've got. So a lot of these tags are useful. And in some cases, they're the best way of knowing which individual animal you've sampled. But a lot of animals actually have their very own natural unique tags and it means we don't have to use these things that could potentially harm them or change the way they behave. So some examples are natural tags from cetaceans now, so from whales and dolphins. So a really popular one is a humpback whale tail as they're so descriptive and tell you so much. So on the left, you can see all the little areas that are really great for identifying them. So you've got the tips and um, the whole trailing edge, that very end of the tail, the nut, which is that V in the middle, and then just the general markings and patterns as of um, usually different patterns of black and white areas on the tail. So you can clearly see when you look at those four animals that they're all different. And if you saw one yourself and took a picture, you might be able to match it to one of them. So another species, the right whale, have callosities on their head, which are animals that are actually living and growing on that animal. Um, so they're quite permanent or they leave scars and so if you take a picture of the top of the head sort of when they're spy hopping as they are in the picture or maybe you fly a drone over the animal looking down you get a picture and you can match those patterns to your catalogue of animals. In the bottlenose dolphin population that I worked with you tend to use their dorsal fins so as you can see on the pictures they're all quite unique one is quite slim and pointy, others might be more rounded. They might have nicks taken out of them just from things like fights with other animals, maybe from interaction with fishing gear or just simply the shape that they were born with. And they can tell us a lot about the animal. And these dorsal fin um, uh, images are also used in killer whales. So the, the actual dorsal fin itself and the saddle patch, which is that white patch behind the dorsal fin, is unique to each animal. So looking at it, you can know which individual it is. And these, this simple information from these natural tags can feed into these huge databases that give us so much information. So in this population of killer whales here, you can see there's a, quite a big family tree that's constructed just from knowing which dorsal fin belongs to who. And some other things that these identifiable marks can tell us is how far an animal ranges and where it goes. So on the left, on the map in the center of that is the Azores. And all the lines correspond to a humpback whale. And at the end of the line is where else it was seen. So they've ranged all the way to Norway, Cape Verde, Guadeloupe, Iceland, the Barents Sea, Newfoundland and Scotland. And this was purely done by someone taking a picture of this animal and searching through a catalogue to match it up. And then on the bottom right, there's a southern right whale. On the left, that's the animal in Antarctica. On the right, it's the same animal in Brazil. So again, that just these two pictures have told us a lot of information about where this animal ranges. Back to a bottlenose dolphin example. This is actually one from the, the Sarasota dolphin population. And she's called Claire. She was born in 1988, and since then she's been seen, seen over a thousand times by the Sarasota Dolphin Research Programme. So they photographed her, uh, her dorsal fin on over a thousand occasions. This has helped uh, gain information, such as her family. So she's had eight calves and also has a great grand calf, and she survived a shark attack. And females in this population have lived up to a maximum of over 60 years. So who knows, this animal could be seen 2000 or more times by the time that she passes away. So I've told you a lot about these marks now and how we estimate the population size. But this is obviously about sound and how we do this with the noises that the dolphins make. So just a bit on uh, bottlenose dolphin sounds and the, the sounds they use uh, throughout their life. So one of the most known ones is their echolocation clicks. Um, so they produce these clicks 
and direct them through the melon, which is sort of what we would think of as the forehead. And this directs the sound out in front of them. They're very high energy clicks and they hit an object in front of them. So it might be something like a fish. And some of that energy is then reflected back to them. And it enters, as they don't have external ears, it enters through the lower jaw to their inner ear. And then through that sound, they can decide what it was in front of them. Maybe is it a fish or not, how big or small it is. And that's how they create it, almost a picture of their environment. So I'll play you one of these sounds, but I'll just explain first what we're looking at here. So it's a spectrogram, which is a visual rep representation of the sound. So the top one is 30 seconds long and the Y axis. So as we're going up, uh, that's a higher frequency and the more green it is or the more bright the sound is, that means it's more loud. And then on the bottom spectrogram, I've just zoomed in to two seconds of this clip. So you can see the spacing between those clicks and sometimes they produce quite fast clicks together and sometimes there's a, a bit of a bigger gap. But so I'll play this sound so you can hear what it's like. You might need to turn your volume up for this one because it's a little bit quiet, but do make sure you turn it back down after. So with these echolocation clips, we can answer quite a lot of interesting questions. So if we pop a hydrophone in the water, which is just an underwater microphone, and we detect these clicks in an area that we might be interested in, they can tell you when the dolphins are there. So maybe are they there uh, when there's a lot of shipping activity or are they in a place where you want to maybe construct something? They can give us this information, but what they can't tell us is who is there and how many animals are there. So this is where the whistles come in. So I'll play you a couple of examples of whistles and these are from the Sarasota dolphin population. Uh, so I'll do this top one first. And the second one. So I'm hoping you heard those. So those are whistles produced by bottlenose dolphins, and these are produced in a bit, bit of a different way to the clicks. So they have something called phonic lips near their blowhole. And as they pass air through those phonic lips, they produce these whistle sounds. So sometimes if you're looking at a dolphin underwater or a video of one while they whistle, you might see bubbles of air leave their blowhole as they produce this sound. And as you can see on these spectrograms, there's clear differences between the one on the top and the one on the bottom. And this is actually known as a signature whistle. So all bottlenose dolphins have these signature whistles, which are learned individually distinctive whistle types that broadcast the identity of the owner. And they develop when they're a calf in their first year of life and they are thought to last a lifetime. So again, this is that individually unique mark that tells us what animal is who, and it also lasts forever. So when we go back to our mark recapture assumption that it must be permanent, it must not harm the animal and it must, make, must not make them more likely to be captured. We've got a perfect mark here. So then we tried to apply that mark recapture framework to these signature whistles to see if we could count the number of animals in Walvis Bay in Namibia. So in Namibia, there is this catalog of signature whistles for the animals. So there's just 28 of them here. There's over 50 now. And each one is unique to an individual. So we use this catalog and we deployed some hydrophones. So they're just these, un these microphones that go underwater. We attach them to an anchor and a buoy, and we can just leave them out at sea. So we were working in Walvis Bay, which is shown in the center. And we had these four different hydrophone stations. We knew that the animals use this area a lot. They've been, the Namibian Dolphin Project have been studying this population for over a decade. So we know lots about them. We know they use this area, but we weren't sure how often or how well we could pick these animals up and then if we would eventually be able to count them. So we looked at two different questions here. 
The first one was the location. So as I said, they use this bay regularly, but we wanted to look at the differences in how we captured their signature whistles at the four different sites to see if there was differences in the area and to see how important the question was of where to place the hydrophone. And we also wanted to look at differences over time. So we focus this on one site, the one in the north at Aphrodite Beach, because we knew the dolphins use this area a lot. And we could look at, in, at differences across time, how often animals, uh, were recorded and how many times they produced that whistle. So again, if we go back to our assumptions that samples must be independent, we put our hydrophones in for three weeks. This was our capture occasion. We let, let it, left it in there, let the dolphins um, vocalize around it. We took it out for a week to do things like charge the batteries, download the data. And this was our um, break between those samples, letting the dolphins mix back into the population before we then put the hydrophone in again. And we did that for six months in total. So this pop popping the hydrophones out at sea was the easy part. The more difficult part was then actually finding the dolphins because we had hundreds and hundreds of hours of underwater recordings. And obviously to listen to that much uh, sound would be take a very long time. So we needed a way to speed this up. So what we did on the left, you'll see two blue spectrograms. So the top one is called a long-term spectral average. So what you're looking at is half an hour of times so all squished up into this little window. And the green stripes that you can see are those echolocation clicks that we listened to before. And you can clearly see the time on times on here, the occasions that the dolphins are echolocating that obviously around the hydrophone and vocalizing. So then you can zoom into these and on the bottom, we've now got just five seconds. And here at this time scale, we can see more clearly when the whistles occur. So there's three whistles there, some may be signature whistles, as I presented to you before, and some may just be little fragments of whistles, because dolphins do also produce whistles that aren't signatures, um, the function of which isn't fully understood. But our focus was the signature whistles that matched our catalogue. So if we take this example here, we know that this is animal number 15 and he was captured or she was captured on this day. So then we got some quite in sorry, interesting results from this analysis. So when we compared the location, we had those four stations. The one at the top was sort of the most popular with the dolphins. We heard them there on 64 occasions throughout our six months and they produced clicks and whistles, but only on around a quarter of the occasions did they produce the signature whistles. And they're the specific sound that lets us know what animal it is. So they're the ones that we're bothered about. But then if we go down to the station at the south, the dolphins weren't there as much, only 12 occasions where we heard the dolphins vocalizing there, but there was no signature whistles at all. So obviously if we put a hydrophone there, it would be no good to be able to count the animals. So why is this? So evidence has shown that sign signature whistles are cohesion calls. So what that means is basically when groups of dolphins meet at sea, they will produce their signature whistles in sort of a greeting ceremony. So one group may produce theirs, the other may produce them back, maybe to introduce each other to so you know who's around. They also are produced differently depending on what behaviour the animals are doing or what group composition they're in. So if there's calves there, if it's a big group, if it's a small group. And we know that different behaviors are used in different areas. So one area might be popular for foraging, one might be popular for resting. So this showed us that it really was important where we were gonna pick uh, the place to put this hydrophone to be able to count the animals. We then looked in at how different the animals actually were in producing their signature whistle. So we found that some animals were really noisy, really chatty and would produce their own signature whistle in an encounter up to 50 times, so repeating its whistle over and over again. Some uh, dolphins were a lot quieter than that, and there were many occasions where a signature whistle was only recorded once. And obviously we don't know how many times there were dolphins that were there that just didn't whistle, because we had no visual data to go with this. So all we know about the animals that are there comes from these recordings. So if we go back to that mark recapture assumption that all animals must be equally likely to be captured. So we did think, well, what if the animals that are more chatty that produce their whistles more are more likely uh, to be picked up and recorded? And we actually looked at this in more detail, but there were, I think, around 46 occasions where we 
picked up whistles just from one occasion when the animal had just produced their signature whistle once. So we don't really know how much of a problem this is. And we also don't really know what drives one individual to maybe be a lot more chatty than another. When we looked at variation in time, so going across the six months of that data collection period, um, we wanted to look at how differently the animals use the area. So in this um, graph, each vertical line corresponds to one of our individuals represented by their signature whistle. And the colours reflect the time period. So we recorded from January to June and each colour reflects one of those months. So some animals were in the bay and whistling in many months. So there was one animal that actually was uh, recorded on five different occasions within five different months. So they use the area quite frequently or whistle quite frequently. But then there were many animals that were only captured in one month. So maybe they didn't really use the bay much or they came and they just weren't recorded, they weren't whistling. So again, when we come back to that assumption that they're equally likely to be captured, we have this difference in the frequency that we captured them. But this is quite typical of a mark recapture study and of dolphin, uh, buffalo's dolphin populations that you have a few that use the area a lot and some that, that um, sorry, that are more resident, that are always there, and then some that are a bit more transient that may use it on occasion, but not as often as others. So then the main question that we wanted to answer with this data then was how many animals are in this population? So we created this curve, which is known as a discovery curve, and it's basically adding new animals on each time you discover them. So each node or little round circle on that graph corresponds to a day when we found more animals. So there was a few when we'd maybe uh, record one or two new animals. There was a big jump in the middle around April when suddenly there was one day where loads of new animals came into the area. And then it has this characteristic shape where it begins to plateau and flatten off. And what that means is we found all the animals there. And it um, agrees with this assumption that there's no immigration or emigration and no births or deaths. If there were lots of new animals joining this population from a neighboring population, or if there were lots of new births throughout this six month period, that graph would keep going up and up and up. And every time you put that hydrophone back out, there will be new signature whistles, new individuals identified, but it doesn't, it tails off as it gets to around 50 animals. And at 53, that was the total number of animals that we detected in this population over that six month period. So once we put it into that equation, looking at our capture occasions and then how many we capture the next time, how many were marked, we estimated that there were 58 individuals in this population and that estimate sits between 54 and 68. So we're pretty sure it lies somewhere between those numbers. So then how does this compare? So a year before this study was published, an estimate on the population size was actually published using the more traditional method of taking pictures of their fins for photo identification. And this estimate uh, was between 54 and 82 individuals. So you can see that our estimate is a pretty good guess and it, and it overlaps very well. So this method obviously is promising and it could be applied elsewhere. So when we look at what next, what does this mean? So one of the things that I find so fascinating with this population in Namibia is that they're so hard to study. So if we look at this map on the right, this is the population density in Namibia. So the darker it is, the more people that live there. So there's two red dots in the middle of that map on the, on the coastal side on the left. The bottom dot is Walvis Bay, where the Namibian Dolphin Project do most of their um, field work. And there's lots of people there and there's lots of people to see dolphins and sometimes people might see a dolphin take a picture and send it in or they might let the Namibian Dolphin Project know that there are dolphins there so it's quite um, common that if a dolphin's there it will be seen and it will be photographed but then there's so much coastline that's rugged and uninhabited and you just couldn't survey realistically by taking pictures of the animals and taking boats out so I think this is a really cool way of um, serving large areas and understanding more about these animals in areas that are quite inaccessible. So hopefully one day we'll learn more about perhaps where these animals are when they're not in the bay. And this could be done using something as simple as a hydrophone uh, left out in the sea. 
So aside from dolphins, um, there are many, many other ways that this uh, method could be applied to different species. So I just picked up a few uh, species that actually have individually unique calls um, that this method could be applied to. So you've got African savanna elephants, uh, Amazonian manatees, uh, chiff chaffs, common marmosets, and green frogs. So sometimes we think of a bottlenose dolphin as quite a complex animal. They're maybe quite smart and intelligent, and that's why they have um, such a, an elaborate vocal repertoire and they've developed these individual calls. But actually we can see here that there's a huge variety of animals that have this complexity and have these individually unique calls from uh, mammals, amphibians, big and small, terrestrial and marine. So I think there's a lot of ways that this uh, method could be applied and could help us learn more about the number of animals that there are of a species that are increasing or decreasing and could contribute a lot to conservation. And I just thought I'd finish off actually about telling you some other cool things that I think you can do with sound. Because I'm sure we all know how we can survey animals and we can see them and count them in those ways. But there's lots of things actually that we can do with sound other than just count them. Um, so these are all some of my favorite recent studies actually on cetaceans. Um, so just last year, there was a whole new population of blue whales that was discovered. And this was doing, done purely through sound and uh, recording their songs. So this was in the Indian Ocean. And basically each blue whale population has, an in, uh, has a unique song to that population. So despite them being the largest animals on earth, we didn't see them, we didn't know they were there, but we heard them and that allowed us to discover that it was a whole new population to science. Another interesting, quite recent study was about fin whale songs and how they could tell us what the ocean floor was made up of. So when they emit this song, the sound waves travels through the oceanic crust and it's reflected by the ocean sediment. So this can provide us with information on the structure of the seabed and what is below. So another very cool sound, uh, finding again, just with sound that may actually benefit humans and tell us what's in our environment. And the last one was a study done off the east coast of North America. And this used a huge, huge data set collected from loads of hydrophones that were deployed over 10 years. And throughout that data set, it looked for these whale calls. And based on where the whale calls were, depending, um, depending on when that, where that hydrophone was deployed, could tell you what areas they were using. And this is really important for things like these species who actually have had a huge shift in where they're distributed and it's thought to be related to climate change and this could be important for things like conservation if you're conserving or working to conserve a specific area but then these animals move out of that area you then need to change uh, where you're focusing your conservation efforts and again this was a study done purely through recording these animals underwater and so with that, I am finished in pretty much my main talk. I just want to thank the people that I did this work on the Mark Recapture project. It was during my undergraduate work at the University of Plymouth uh, under the supervision of Dr. Claire Embling and Dr. Tess Gridley of the Namibian Dolphin Project. And if you do want to hear more about the bioacoustics work and studies of cetaceans in Africa, then CSEARCH have a lot of information to share. So do check that out. And with that, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed and maybe learned something. And if you do have any questions, I, will, I am happy to take them now. Or you can get in touch with me uh, at a later date. But thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Emma. I was, I was pressing buttons out of order. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bef we do have some questions, so before we get to that, I will just um, make sure everyone knows all the ways that they can find more about DCP as well. Um, so if you are looking for more recordings of DCP webinars, you can find those directly on our website under the education tab, just look for webinars. Um, or if you prefer YouTube, we're there cleverly uh, under Dolphin Communication Project. Um, 
And then this was a deep dive, so geared a little bit more towards an older audience. We also have Dolphin Lessons, which are geared more towards um, elementary students and the young at heart. Those tend to be most first and third Tuesdays. Our next uh, Dolphin Lesson is next Tuesday, and it's going to be another drawing lesson. Um, so we will learn how to draw an orca or a killer whale. And if you've listened to all of our webinars and you still want more, make sure you check out our podcast, The Dolphin Pod. You can get that directly from our website or wherever you tech savvy people get your podcasts. And then finally, we are a nonprofit, so we are thrilled to offer these programs for free, but we also are very appreciative of your support. You can support us by adopting a wild dolphin, becoming a member, joining us in the field. Um, if anyone is feeling ready to travel um, and you're listening to this um, in May or June of 2021, uh, you can still join us in Bimini in the Bahamas in our July 2021 Eco Tour. Um, and of course, stay in touch at our website, social media, email, and all of that. Um, so with that, we will get to some questions. I'm trying to pull the, Kathleen, the chat's not coming up for me. I know someone had just submitted something. Could you maybe start with that one? Yes, and uh, Jason actually took the words out of my mouth. I was gonna ask that as well. Uh, and as he says here, it's well established that dolphins can use each other's signature whistles. They can mimic one another. So how did you account for that in your analysis? Yeah, okay, that's, that's a good question. It's something that we thought about a lot and that whenever I talk about this work, someone always asks it. Um, <laughs> So, so basically, yeah, it's possible that they can produce um, a signature whistle that is not theirs, that belongs to someone else. Um, but um, most of the evidence um, around this suggests that it's sort of an exchange or it's done in an occasion where both animals are present at once. So when we were going through the data, it was usually very clear when there was a copy because you would see very distinct whistles that are so similar in shape. And then you'd see one that was like that whistle but it always seemed to have something that was a little bit different maybe there was um it wasn't quite a perfect copy and often the the copies would overlap the original whistle on the spectrogram so we went with the rule that any whistles that overlap are obviously regarded as the copies and are discarded there's still the chance obviously that we could have some copies in there but again going back to that point that if a copy is produced the owner of the whistle is likely there and in our project, because we didn't, essentially we wanted to know which animals were there. So if there was a copy and we actually kept it within the analysis, um, the animal that owned it was still probably around the hydrophone within that group at the time. So whether we sort of, I guess, recorded its signature or we also included a copy of its signature, that animal is still there. So that's sort of the, the mentality that we went with but it is a good point and there's a lot we still don't know about copying and why they do it and how often it's done and if they can do it without the presence of the the signature whistle owner so it is a good point that still needs to be understood really cool thank you um i have a, a methods question that popped up um when you deployed the hydrophones and they were recording for three weeks was that continuous recording or was it just sampling portions of the day? Yeah, so that was a 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off cycle. Um, so that was another question we looked at because we thought what if actually there's more individuals there and they're just whistling all the time during that 10 minutes off. So we plotted discovery curves for those events as well. And we found that um, it didn't actually matter how long a recording was we always got this plateau even in the short recordings and after about I think it was it is in the paper somewhere I think it's after 30 minutes of recording and um, it always sort of plateaued and we didn't get any additional dolphins so we think that even in that 10 minutes on 10 minutes off duty cycle we still managed to capture all the animals that are there. Thank you. Um, so many things to consider. Um, <laughs> You talked a little bit about um, dolphins being quiet, right? They, they don't have to be vocalizing, let alone whistling. Um, we had two questions that I'm going to ask at the same time because I think they're related and you can answer however you'd like. Um, the first one is if there's a particular scenario 
Um, and I don't know if the person was getting at kind of if, if there's a predator in the area or something about the weather. Is there a scenario where you would expect that the dolphins might be quiet? Um, and then maybe linked to that, what are some of the um, human impacts that they're dealing with in that area? Yeah, so in terms of them being quiet, obviously we had those times I showed you where at the North Station, we got signature whistles sort of a quarter of the time. At the South Station, they weren't there vocalizing as much and they didn't produce their signature whistles. So that probably corresponds to what they use those areas for. So maybe if they're resting uh, and they're vocalizing less. And also at that Southern Station, it was um, by a container terminal that was actually being constructed uh, during the project. So that probably contributes um, maybe to why they're not vocalizing as much. And also with the static hydrophones, they're just left in the water, they can't move. So if that dolphin is moving away as they're producing their signature whistle and it's just not clear enough on the spectrogram for us to see, then we just can't in, um, identify the individual. So I guess um, them being quiet is a mix of them actually being quiet and our limitation in being able to record them. Along, along those lines as a methods question, uh, the four hydrophone stations you had identified, and I, and I was looking closely at your scale, uh, because if you were localizing, it looks like your hydrophones were far enough apart that if you had a group of animals vocalizing on your north station, it wouldn't be picked up on the two middle or the southern station. So you actually had independent samples from those four hydrophones was that the case for the middle stations as well? Because they looked closer together. Yeah, so we never had a time when they could be heard on multiple stations at once, but we did have days when they obviously swam down that coastline. They were heard on one, then were heard on one that was further south. Um, but yeah, they weren't close enough to be able to detect them at once, so we couldn't do any localization. Cool. Awesome. I had other questions, but I think some of them have been asked already. I had I had my list of questions. Um, <laughs> but one other one other question: since this was a mark, it was a capture mark recapture study. I'm sort of assuming that the capture portion of it was done before this study was done, so that you actually had a catalog of whistles for all the dolphins that then you the the data you collected in this study you matched to. So you weren't confirming. Uh, signature whistles for the animals you were studying you already had that catalog set up yeah so i guess that was one of the things that um helped a lot in this project that we already had that initial catalog so in 2014 and um, they collated that catalog and i think there was about 40 animals and um, and that picture of the different ones that comes from that paper um, so they had that already, so I used some of those, but then obviously our data was coming a few years after that, so there's new calves in the population and new animals, um, so we worked with that catalogue as well as adding new signature whistles on using the, the SIG ID method, which is signature identification, and there's certain rules in that that makes a signature whistle, um, depending on how many whistles are produced and how, in what time they're produced, so yeah, we did a, a mix of both, had a catalogue and added on, yeah. And then uh, Jason, just we'll do one more. Is that okay, Cal? We have time. Okay. Uh, nope, Jason, that's perfect. Thank you. And this is this is something new to me as well. Do you have any individuals that have known multiple signature whistles? That's a good question. So in we don't we don't have any that we know about. Um, so obviously there are other populations globally that might maybe an alliance of males share this other whistle so they have their own whistle and then they have this sort of secondary one that they share with just a few other individuals uh, but we haven't found any evidence of that in the Namibian population but who knows it could be there and we just don't know. Do you have, does, is the social population known to have that type of social structure in Namibia similar to Shark Bay? Um, I don't, it's not as uh, clearly as tight as that population in Shark Bay, but there are, are like groups of mothers and calves and males together, but not quite that really tight structure. And I'm sorry, I added that one in. I snuck it in. <laughs> That's good. Well, I'm going to sneak one more in. I'm, I'm watching the clock and we got one, one last question popped in. Um, did your hydrophones pick up other species or was this area predominantly bottlenose dolphins? Yeah, so in the area there is, predominantly bottlenose dolphins. There are some heavy sides, which obviously just produce the clicks um, that they don't tend to use the areas quite as inshore as we were studying. And then there was maybe the odd 
um, song that might have occurred within the recordings from things like Humpback Whales, but the area is this predominantly used by bottlenose dolphins in terms of cetaceans. Yeah, so there were no other particularly similar um, cetaceans with similar sounds that would have been picked up. Cool. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, mm -hmm. Emma. Um, I know that I really enjoyed that one. Um, and I hope that our listeners did as well. And we wish the Namibian Dolphin Project the best of luck and you the best of luck with um, your ongoing work. And uh, thanks everyone for joining. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.